Okay, so I'm here today with Sandro DeMeo. Hi Sandro, thanks for joining us today. Hi, thanks Rachel, great to be here. Um, good to meet you too. Um, I met you on Twitter just last week really, after we used one of your videos in our courses and I'm really delighted that you've come to talk to us today so I can talk to you about a little bit more about what you do and yeah. the things that you're involved in with the World Health Organization and all your work, which is really, really interesting. Um, so I'm not going to do that for you. Um, perhaps um, you could just introduce yourself to us and to me and us and anyone else listening, just so that we have a little bit of an idea about who you are and what you get up to. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So um, as you nicely introduced, my name is Alessandro DeMeo. I'm a medical officer with the World Health Organization here in Geneva at our global headquarters. I work in the Department for Nutrition for Health and Development uh, in the Evidence and Program Guidance Unit. Uh, so my position as a medical officer sees me doing a number of different things, um, providing technical assistance to member states and to other organizations, uh, building normative evidence, so building guidelines and um, the evidence that goes into those guidelines, uh, and then also obviously um, building the, the scientific knowledge and working with our uh, collaborating centres around the world to, to, to do that. Um, there's also a translational process, uh, so not only in terms of, we talked about building the evidence, uh, building the guidelines, but then also working with civil society to translate those into policy uh, with and for civil society in the non-governmental sector. Um, before I came to WHO, I joined WHO last November, um, and before I came here, I spent two years uh, as a postdoctoral fellow in the US um, and an assistant professor. Uh, before that, I did a, a PhD in Copenhagen uh, in NCDs, uh, was lucky enough to spend time on and off in Mongolia, and that's where the, that's when I made the film that you saw last week on the social determinants of health, part of a, a MOOC that we put together at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, and then before that, I was a medical doctor, and I um, did a master's in public health and worked in, in Australia in uh, Indigenous health and primary care, emergency medicine. Um, and then parallel to my sort of uh, professional career, I've also been very heavily involved in uh, a number of social startups um, and the NGO space. So I started NCD Free with my brother, who's a designer, uh, back in 2013. Um, we launched Festival 21 last year, which was a large, open uh, public festival. We, we had 5,000 people attend um, on the last day of COP21 for a, an event around climate change and food um, and global health. And then I've also been very heavily involved in helping to establish also the EAT initiative, which is a multi-sectoral uh, platform for bringing together food, health and sustainability uh, across science, business and, um, uh, and civil society. So, um, yeah, that's a little bit about me and um, maybe we can we can talk more about uh, NCDs. Yeah, for sure. Um, your, your background is really interesting. Global health, public health, NCDs are the messages that I'm hearing. And I think um, I, I feel like I could sit here and chat to you all day. And so we must keep, we must keep this short. But uh, yeah, a lot cool. of the things you've been involved in are very entwined, I think, in mm -hmm. our sort of mission as at Physiopedia. So, yeah. so it's really good to talk to you. So thank you so much. But what we're going to do today is try and keep this around NCDs um, yeah, right. to keep it focused. I'm sure we could talk to you again another day about other things. So so just to start on the NCD thing. Um, so we obviously as physiotherapists, we work a lot with people with chronic illness and NCDs and um, and obviously, we talk a lot about the four major NCDs in cardiovascular disease, chronic respiratory disease, cancer and diabetes, and we work with all those sorts of patients. Um, so, But I know that um, NCDs are wider than that, really. Mm. So I just maybe you could, and I know that a lot of people just talk about those four main NCDs, and we know those so well. But I was wondering if you could just perhaps give us your take on NCDs yeah. and what they are. Sure, sure, sure. So to understand NCDs, we need to sort of take a step back and, and look at where the name and, and the concept came from. So NCDs stand for li literally diseases you can't catch. Um, it's a sort of a strange way of, of um, framing a group of diseases, you know, frame them by something they're not. Not, not a great way of, of, of communicating an important concept. Um, 
the reason for that is that they were actually once the the kind of the the waste bin of global health. They were the the things that that didn't really cause major concerns. They were the the other agenda, the kind of leftover agenda. Um, so if we go back a hundred years, the, these weren't big problems for global health: diabetes, heart disease, obesity, cancer, lung diseases, uh, mental illness. These these weren't the big challenges that we were we were really focusing um, resources and, and attention around. And, and that was really, the focus was really around maternal child health, was around nutrition, undernutrition, uh, it was around um, food security, uh, it was around producing more food, uh, a focus on sort of scaling up um, uh, food production. Uh, it was around also water and sanitation was, you know, obviously a big, a big challenge for the planet. And finally, infectious diseases. Infectious diseases were the major sort of public health scourges. And that was back in a time when we thought of um, global health. Global health didn't really exist. We actually, we, we thought about it as public health, uh, born out of John Snow and, and the epidemics in London, um, industrialization and people moving to cities, be, living closer to each other. Suddenly, infectious diseases were able to move more quickly. Um, also, the problems of water and sanitation, people living in big cities with poor water and sanitation. So that was the, the birthplace of public health. And then as we moved forward, and I suppose forged largely through these kind of um, bilateral uh, relationships between the traditional uh, co colonial nations, the sort of the, um, the colonizers and, and the north and the south sort of relationships, then was born uh, international health. And international health was really about how you know, rich countries could help poorer countries with their major public health challenges, which was where, you know, the big focus on infectious diseases, on um, all of the traditional uh, uh, in, uh, tropical medicine type challenges came forward. And then finally, um, you know, over the last 30, 40 years, we've seen a huge transition in um, all sorts of parts of, of, of our modern society, the way we live, the way we eat, uh, our economies, um, the way we move around the planet, the way we trade and interact. So, you know, looking at um, globalization of trade uh, and the fact that we all of our markets are connected, globalization of information, uh, marketing of, of, you know, foods of certain lifestyles are now global, um, globalization of our food systems, um, globalizations of even, of even culture. So, so, you know, globalization has been one major factor that's changed. Another is an aging population. You know, as, as people are not dying younger from preventable diseases that we did a really good job of, of uh, making inroads on last century, uh, people are living longer, but therefore they're, they're getting different types of diseases. And finally, um, it's the urbanization piece as well. So, you know, for the first time in history, more than half the planet now lives in cities. And that comes with a very different way of living. You look at Mongolia, where I did my PhD, people moved from very seasonal lifestyle, very seasonal diets. They lived in a yurt in minus 40 degrees for six months of the year. Um, and, and in 20 years, that's, that country's gone from about 30% uh, or less urbanization to more than 70% urbanization. So that's a process that, that most industrialized or you know, rich countries like Australia and the US and the UK, high, so-called high-income countries, they might have gone through that process of a change in, in their food, in the way they live, in the way that they move, in the way that they design their cities, in the way, in the way that, that they, that they, um, uh, that they uh, work. That, that whole process might have taken 200 years. In these countries, it's taking 20 years. So, you know, those three big changes that we've seen at the global level have led to what's called a, an epidemiological transition. And that's a change in not only the length of lives and also generally how many babies people have, uh, but importantly, changes in uh, the types of diseases that affect people. And so for all of those reasons, as well as the fact that we've been probably a little bit late to come to the party on, um, on realising the burden of NCDs, uh, we've, we're now left with a situation where actually what was the, the leftover agenda, the kind of the non-big uh, things, are now the leading causes of global deaths. And that's the same in, in almost every country on the planet. Every country is facing rising levels of overweight and obesity um, and every region is, is facing rising levels of childhood overweight and obesity. So overweight and obesity, uh, sorry, NCDs are, are, are put you know, into this uh, four by four 
because not because they're the four main diseases, the only ones that are important. I think if you look at the four by four table of, that you would have seen um, as as clinicians, um, what's really important, and I think what the reason why we created that as a global community, um, because obviously we do leave certain NCDs off, and and that's a challenge. Well, I think the biggest strength of that four by four though is actually the shared modifiable risk factors, not the four diseases themselves. So the point of clumping those together was to say, look, there's a lot of confusion. There's a big agenda that we haven't moved quickly on. We need to do, we need to work quickly to bring NCDs under control. And there are four shared modifiable risk factors that we can really base a lot of our focus around um, exercise, nutrition, alcohol, tobacco, but there are also others. Um, so, so you have those four, but you also obviously have mental illness, you have dementia, you have a number of other, um, uh, NCDs, but I think the really important part is to think what are the shared risk factors? What are the shared determinants of, of these diseases and how can we go after those? And, and that's where obviously nutrition. So, um, I work in nutrition and a lot of what we focus on, um, is, uh, is around the changes in nutrition and how we can make really important changes, really important recommendations um, to improve people's lives and uh, not just the length of their lives but also the quality of their lives through nutrition, um, how we can focus on very vulnerable groups like mothers, like pregnant women, uh, like early children in, in the early stages of so-called thousand days, first thousand days of life um, and, and optimizing nutrition for them so that they can live uh, a healthy life free from um, NCDs. But obviously also part of that and related to what this course is also the importance of, of exercise and of physical activity. And so thinking, you know, about, um, about those four different uh, diseases and mental illness, because mental illness obviously strong links between mental illness and physical activity as well. Um, you know, really trying to think how do those four uh, modifiable risk factors work across those four, five, six uh, NCDs. In terms of where we're at today, so um, a quick snapshot of the epidemiology, we now know that NCDs are the leading causes of global deaths. They kill more than two in three people on the planet. Um, they're the highest rates of NCDs, age standardised NCDs, um, including overweight and obesity, is actually in uh, middle-income countries, not high-income countries. So that's often a surprise for people. Very high uh, burdens in the Middle East, often a very often a surprise for people. Um, we also know that the the change. There are still countries, very very poor countries in the world, where undernutrition is the major challenge. But that cha that change from undernutrition to overweight and obesity and NCDs being the the sort of overwhelming burden happens at actually a a relatively low GDP. It's only a GDP of around two and a half thousand dollars, and you start to see the changeover from uh, the transition from uh, undernutrition to overweight and obesity. And with that comes also all the changes that we were talking about before, and and how they impact on on food, but also physical uh, inactivity. We know that uh, in the world today, around um, half a billion people are uh, underweight, but importantly, one point nine billion. Uh, people on the planet are now overweight. Uh, of those, about 600 are obese. 600 million are obese. So there's a big challenge, um, and and I think if we then think about it in those across those four modifiable risk factors, we've made a lot of progress um, in a lot of in a lot of areas. Um, I think we can talk about NCDs for hours also because NCDs, you know, we think of it sort of as one of these um, so-called super wicked problems of the 21st century. And I think that's really the difference between global health and public health is that, you know, to tackle NCDs is not going to take uh, sort of one important lever at one level. Um, it's going to take sort of multiple levers at multiple levels across multiple sectors, well beyond health. Um, and, and, and I think when we look at physical inactivity, it's exactly the same. I mean, we can look at you know, as a clinician, what recommendations do we make to individuals? What can I do to get more physical activity? Um, you know, certainly simple things that would increase um, uh, incidental exercise, I think, is really important. Um, you know, getting off the bus a, a stop early and taking the stairs and all those sorts of things. But quite frankly, they're not going to kind of solve the problems of obesity um, and NCDs worldwide. I think we're seeing that you know, physical inactivity, physical activity is very, very important for cardiovascular health, for mental health, uh, for fitness. 
Um, you know, when it comes to weight, diet is also very, very important. But I think, uh, you know, a lot of it actually comes when it comes to physical activity and diet, we need to be thinking not about the individual, but ab about the about how society is structured and the policies that um, uh, are put in place around us and the social determinants of health. Now, the social determinants of health can very often get kind of lost in a in a cloud of like um, uh, sort of this nebulous cloud that no one really understands what they mean. But I think you know if you think about um, I, I you know I'm not a particularly active person, but um, you know for me the social determinants of health became very very clear when I moved to Denmark um, and and moved to Copenhagen, and suddenly the structural determinants of health became very very clear. And what I mean by that is that um, I suddenly overnight I found myself riding to work um, or riding everywhere and and getting a lot of exercise and staying very fit. Now, I don't like running. Um, I do it for about a week and then I give up. Um, you know, I've tried to do swimming on the way to work, but then I get all sweaty and have to put on a tie. Um, I could probably walk to work, but then I'd have to have a change of clothes here. So it, it all works for about a week and then I give up. So you need to make health the path of least resistance and you need to make physical activity the path of least resistance for people, for them to really be able to change their behaviours in the long term. And, and, and that's exactly what an environment like Copenhagen has done. Universal bike lanes, uh, very good quality uh, uh, public transport, but it's not particularly cheap. Uh, private cars are extremely expensive. Taxation, I think, is about 100 or more than 100% of the of the price of the car is 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 in is then taxed, um, and the whole centre of the city is off limits to cars. So what results is you know not someone like me uh, thinking well I'm going to take uh, my bike to work because that's the right thing to do for me or for the environment. Um, it, it, it's, it's just cheaper and it's easier and it's safe and it's convenient and I get there in a quarter of the time of a bus and it costs a fraction of a car. Um, if you compare that to then Australia where, you know, uh, Melbourne, it's, there are parts of Melbourne that are very, very good, but a big part of Melbourne, it's almost impossible. You, you leave your house and you go, you go straight out onto a massive road. There are no bike lanes. Um, the distances are huge. You know, we have this very centralised model of urban planning um, and, and, you know, cars are cheap, petrol is cheap, public transport is not fantastic um, and is quite expensive. So, you know, it, it's thinking about sort of um, the public and, and I could talk also about, you know, then food, but um, I think for both, you know, we know that there's, a, there's an enormous burden. We know that they're largely caused by, you know, at the end of the day, we put food in our mouths, we decide to get on the bicycle or not. But there's, there are much, much bigger um, determinants at play that either make that really easy or really, really hard. And it's really, I think, about, you know, as cities are developing, as countries are developing, or as countries are developed and kind of becoming more urban and gentrifying, we need to be thinking about how we actually build environments, build societies where and even build cultures where uh, exercise is not just for physical activity is not just for uh, the health nuts, but it's it's for everyone simply because it's easy and it's easiest. I think um, that was brilliant. Um, I think you've covered everything that I wanted to ask you about there. <laughs> um, Sorry, I, I, I can go off on a rant sometimes. No, no, that's not a rant at all. That was absolutely perfect. Um, so I think it, that's a really good message for clinicians. I think as as physiotherapists and um, that we that mainly listen to these these videos that we do, um, we do focus a lot on on the four main NCDs. It's what we see the most. We see others as well that we we possibly don't think of as NCDs, um, but they they're all in that group. And I think our main the main thing that we have to offer is physical activity and exercise, and and that is what we think about and movement and and encouraging people to do more. And I don't think we think about anything or we don't necessarily think much broader than that mm. um we know we know that there are other things at play but we don't sort of pay attention to those so i think it's really good what's really good is to just listen to you talking about the wider picture of global health and ncds and and what is involved in the whole issue especially the sort of development and development side of things it's really interesting to hear you talk about that i think 
as in, as individual clinicians to contribute to that, I guess one of the things that we can be thinking of is how we build our clinics um, mm. and things like that. That's the simplest thing we can do and maybe how we can contribute to our local communities. Just as mm. individual clinicians, I think it's quite hard for us to think about wider um, wider community policy and things. It's it's uh, a special in, or, or a certain individual that will try and get involved in that, which which would be commendable. But just as an individual clinician, are there any sort of messages that you would give for, for an individual clinician who's just has a clinic and their local community of clients and patients that they work for? The sort of things that they could be thinking about. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I mean, I just wrote wrote a few things down as you're talking. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm a doctor, so I kind of, um, I'm going to probably give, I'm going to say a few things that are not relevant to physiotherapists because they're much smarter and light years ahead of, of uh, my brothers and sisters in medicine. But um, a, a few things that I would kind of keep in mind when you're, um, when you're working with people um, who are affected by NCDs or overweight and obesity and, and, and recommending physical activity and how to kind of structure that. Um, I think the first is really to, as I said before, I kind of the social determinants of health, unfortunately, have become kind of this wishy-washy, you know, um, uh, can be seen as kind of this wishy-washy um, qualitative part of public health. Um, they're not. I mean, they're, they're a very, very important concrete concept. Um, you know, the, the environments in which we're born, grow, uh, learn, work, age and eventually die uh, all have an enormous influence on what we're able to achieve, what opportunities we have, the health that we will achieve and, and the life, um, the quality and longevity of life that we can expect. So I think really having that, having a sense and a strong understanding um, and taking the time to kind of look beyond what is often kind of a stigma towards, particularly from clinicians, towards the social determinants as being something that they don't really need to think about, I think is really important because when you, when you actually start to understand, you know, why it is the person is presenting in, with the conditions that they have, what are the, you know, what are the, what are the environments, what are the challenges, what are the um, uh, economic sort of barriers that, or, or even uh, educational barriers that they face that have kind of made it harder to um, achieve uh, health in, in, in the circumstances that they have. I think you become a better clinician and you, be, you, you become a much more empathetic clinician and the patient feels that and senses that you have a, a better understanding of the real world um, and the challenges that people um, do, do truly face, particularly when you then realise that there is obviously a link, um, an association between poorer uh, socioeconomic groups and these diseases, you're more likely to see people who are facing um, maybe even tough things that we as clinicians very often don't face, um, uh, which, which are also de determining uh, the health that they're able to achieve and the outcomes that they're presenting with. The second thing relates to that, and that's around stigma. And I think there's still a lot of stigma, um, particularly among doctors, hopefully not physiotherapists, but um, around uh, overweight and obesity. Uh, it's still seen as, as, as an outcome. And, and it makes me angry because it's not, it's not true. Um, it couldn't be further from the truth. And all of the evidence proves that. So, so I think, you know, if you're going to be... Um, angry uh, about the obesity epidemic, the individual, the patient in front of you is not the right person to be angry at. Um, I think then third is when you're building a plan is really to try and take what you know about the person, the social determinants, with an understanding sort of um, open uh, approach free of stigma and then build a plan that really relates uh, and engages and is tailored to them. You're trying to ask this person to sort of change the very way they live, the very habits that they have. The, you know, you're probably, you can't think of a harder thing to ask a patient to do. Taking a tablet is pretty easy, but taking, you know, a completely new approach to their lifestyle um, is not only mixed with, you know, the feelings of shame, um, fear of what's going to happen in the future, fear of their health and all of those sorts of feelings, but also you're asking them to do something that's very, very difficult. Um, so I think 
you know, really trying to kind of tailor it and take the time to tailor it to that person, to their culture, and to come up with clever ways that you can actually build these things into their lives um, to make health easy for them. Um, Because ultimately it has to be if it's going to be a long-term change. Um, And then lastly, I mean, I do think, I gave a talk last year to um, the National Summit of um, General Practitioners in Australia. And, you know, I I agree, most clinicians won't think um, about the determinants beyond their patient. And I think that's fine. I think 90% of clinicians focus on what are the determinants that are uh, that are impacting the patient in front of you. But if there are a few uh, who want to engage with the local community to get involved uh, with local schools, um, with, locals, with local uh, community groups, um, to, to work with them to start programs, uh, if you even want to think about getting involved through the physiotherapy societies, you know, big groups of important, powerful uh, bodies, uh, of, of powerful uh, individuals who are informed and empowered um, and have a unified voice can make a big difference at a policy level. And we've seen that many, many times. And I think physiotherapists have a great opportunity of sort of um, of really uh, being that strong unified voice to policymakers on particularly the issue of um, physical activity and the, the determinants that sort of get in the, get in the way of that. So thinking, you know, how can you work within your practice um, to, to integrate those challenges, but also then, you know, what role can you have as an individual, as a collective outside uh, to, to start to, you know, think about uh, either local change, city level change is often a great place to start. Cities, you know, are, are able to move faster, they're able to change policies and they're able to really impact uh, and change um, the environments uh, that, that do determine a lot of these um, a lot of these outcomes, and then how can you, as a as a as a bigger body, as a national body, um, gather and 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 sort of have a clear policy request or policy ask for national governments to address these issues and 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 um, think about these issues as well. I think that's excellent advice. Excellent advice, and um, yeah, really good to hear you talk about those few. Um, ways that clinicians, sh- the things that we should be thinking about when as we interact with our patients, that's really good. I want to just ask you one other thing that um, that I often wonder about, and that is, so when thinking as a physiotherapist, as a clinician, so we're obviously we're the specialists in movement and physical activity and things, so, so that's what we focus on. But there are the other four modifiable, three, other three modifiable risk factors, nutrition, smoking, alcohol. Now, that especially and in particular nutrition I think you've talked a lot about obviously smoking alcohol that's easy we need to stop that but nutrition's more complex than that and and those sorts of things are kind of outside our scope of practice especially in nutrition so what is what do you think I mean you're you're a medical person so what do you think how do we approach giving advice or or not giving advice, but how do we approach those other fa- three modifiable risk factors when they're kind of outside our scope of practice? Mm. Well, I mean, I think that's where, and again, you, you're talking to a global audience, so it's hugely variable in terms of how physiotherapists work. But certainly my experience of the best um, clinical physiotherapists as a doctor, um, because you have a skill set that's very complementary that, that I don't have, um, and and so... I think the the best approach that you can have is to be open to working with um, working very closely with with people's family physicians or GPs, um, giving them advice and and being kind of a good sounding board. GPs will you know m- maybe afraid to ask us what they seem like a silly question because it's core knowledge for you but not for them. But then you know by kind of being um, open and reaching out, and I think having a good relationship with the treating physicians, with also um, the other the other uh, the other clinicians in the team, um, I think that's where you get the best outcomes uh, outcomes for the patients. I think certainly you can broach the subject, and and you know nutrition is a really important part, even of you know physical activity as the phys- as, as your physical um, habits change. Obviously, you need to think about changes in um in in your sort of diet and and caloric intake as well um and and you're also going to get the best outcomes if you have sort of a multi-pronged approach to to behavior change and to lifestyle change so i think 
you know, reaching out and having a really good relationship with the GP, not being afraid to, you know, maybe write a letter to the clinician and say, you know, these are the things that you're doing. You're very keen to uh, support on these other fronts. Would it be appropriate to also refer to a new to a dietitian to have some professional input um, on the nutrition front, and that you would be happy to sort of, you know, follow up those those different pieces. But I think also you have a, a an opportunity as a as a very influential um, medical pre- professional in in the patient's eyes and life um, to to kind of reinforce those messages as well. So, you know, you're going to run far, you're going to run further and find it easier to to take up running if you quit smoking as well. Um, you know, you're going to find it easier to get up in the morning if you don't have a big night the, the night before uh, involving alcohol or if you can, you know, cut back um, on the alcohol. You're also going to lose weight more quickly if you don't drink as much alcohol. It's a big source of calories, so that relates to physical activity. Um, and and uh, in terms of nutrition, I think, you know, you need to be careful, obviously, always, and I'm the same, you know, I need to be careful not to go outside my scope of practice, but, you know, reinforce the messages that are being provided by your colleagues, work very closely with your colleagues from other, from other professions, and have a, a kind of a, a comprehensive, so that everyone has, is sending the patient the same messages, they're all complementary, um, and you're able to even reinforce those. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that answer. It's something I often think about personally as well. Just um, yeah. And it's good to be able to ask someone like you that question. So thank you for that. Um, very, very often, sometimes you also have these clinics, um, you know, sort of multidisciplinary clinics. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's also, if you're not, if you're not in that situation, you can create that situation um, through referrals and through having open lines of communication. Uh, if you are in that in that um, fortunate circumstance, or you can, you know, learn from those clinics that that do provide those services, where you have a dietitian and a physiotherapist and uh, and a doctor or or uh, other healthcare professionals working very closely together, um, then then you know that's also a way of providing sort of um, the care and making sure that those clinicians are also meeting regularly and and comparing notes again, so that the patient is hearing one clear message that's reinforced across all of the really influential uh, healthcare professionals uh, in, in, their, in their sort of treatment team. Yeah, that's a good way, isn't it? That's something if, if for clinicians to think about if, they're, if you're working to develop your clinics to um, fight, I don't know if fight's the word, right mm. word, NCDs. Um, so you work with your patients and then beyond that, if you can build a dream team of um, multidisciplines, then that's going to really help um, uh, with all your client population to get the same message across, isn't it? And, and that can yeah. be something that people can do if there's no, nothing, if they don't feel that they're able to work beyond their clinic and in the local communities if they don't have time because everyone's busy and things or whatever. So that would be a good a good thing to think about. Yeah, and we can often be afraid of, I think, you know, this is, this is digressing a little bit, but we can often be afraid of working with other sectors um, and, and working, you know, clinicians, doctors are afraid to work with, um, might be afraid to work with a physiotherapist because they know a whole lot of stuff that, that we have no idea about and it makes us feel a little bit small um, and, and they speak a different language very often too and the same with you know dietitians or the same with diabetes educators um, and, and, and I think that it's really important as clinicians not just to talk about multidisciplinary care but to actually really do it and make an effort to you know, engage with and, and be that clinician that is op- that, that you know, your colleagues feel comfortable asking a silly question, um, that your colleagues feel comfortable discussing a difficult patient. Um, and, and that's not a difficult relationship to strike up, but it, it does take, you know, someone um, reaching out. Yeah, good. Okay, um, so we've talked about quite a lot there. I think we've covered, that's, that's a really good introduction to NCDs and how we as clinicians can um, join the fight. Um, uh, is there any other... Are there any other messages that you'd like to end on today that for physiotherapists around the world um, in the work that you do or any messages that you'd like to get out to them? No, I mean, I think um, it's, it's, been, it's been really fun to have a chat. Um, we are, you know, if you head to uh, the WHO website and uh, we have a nutrition website, there's a lot of really good information. There's, there are um, question and answers, there are fact sheets, there are guidelines. Um, all sorts of, I think, really important information that physiotherapists around the world can use. 
um, and I'd encourage them to to head to, head to the website to to learn more. Um, we've just uh, and well, the UN has just announced a, a, a decade of action on nutrition starting uh, in April this year for the next ten years. Obviously, uh, physical activity and the role of physiotherapists will be key to achieving the big ambitions we have for the decade of action within the sustainable development agenda. So um, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of work for us all to do together. And I think uh, I've always really, uh, as a clinician, enjoyed working uh, with physiotherapists. And I would probably also just end by saying we have some great physiotherapists working uh, here with us at the World Health Organization. So um, when, you're, when you're ready for a, a very short break, uh, from clinical practice, uh, we also <laughs> welcome you in the world of public health. Excellent. Um, thank you very much, Sandro. And where can we find out more about you? I know you're on, where can people find you? I know you're on Twitter. Yeah, so um, I'm on Twitter. We're at Sandro DeMeo, one word. Um, you can also head to, I've got a small website, which is sandrodemeo.com, and you can find um, a few of the articles I've written uh, for Huffington Post and a few videos and things you can explore as well. That's excellent. Well, Sandra, it's been it's been absolutely great to talk to you today. I have a feeling that we may talk Thank to you again in the future, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks very much, Rachel. Take care. Thank you.